see. What should we talk about today? Let's talk about God today. It's like when I talk to Pastor, I tell Pastor Troy, sing that song. He said, which one? That one about God. I don't know the titles of those songs, and some of the titles are just dumb. Can I get an amen? Have you ever looked? We, we don't actually put the titles up, do we? No. I, I Troy, where's that? Troy, Troy, I'm talking to you. Troy, I'm talking to you. I think we should put the titles up to the songs just so people can see how dumb some of those titles are. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a second message in Fear Not. Today I want to talk about the face of the redeemed. Uh, I've been thinking about this. I'm going to do a number of messages on fear. There's a lot of things in this world that can cause fear. There's a lot of people who are walking by fear. I've counseled people. I've talked to people. I've watched stuff. And I want you to do me a favor. Can you help me out this morning for a moment? Can I count to three? Can you all give me your best scared face? One, two, three. Some of you are not playing. Oh, wait, that's your normal look. Never mind. Some of you aren't very good at this. Okay. How many of you like roller coasters? How many of you hate roller coasters? How many of you will not go on a roller coaster? How many of you have ever gone on one and thought you were going to die? <laughs> well, let me, you know, let me show you. Let me show you. Look at this guy. Look at this little guy. I mean, he's pretty sure the angel of death is on that thing with him. Right? I mean, hey, come on, honey. Let's go. This will be fun. For the rest of his life, he's been traumatized. He's still in therapy today. How about her? Whoa. <laughs> I don't know which I'm laughing at more, the face or the hair. How about this one? Whoa. She's not sure she's going to make it. And then, of course, there's this one right here. She's in therapy after that little girl, okay, or that little boy. She comes in, okay. Uh, how about this one? That's not good. And, then, and, like, and this one's like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, I'm not riding a roller coaster with you ever again, man. Now, this one here, I like. This is one of my favorite ones right here. Little girl's having a blast. Like, she's just like, this is so much fun, Dad. Dad's like, dear Jesus. But it gets worse. <laughs> yep. He did it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He now lives in infamy. <laughs> I mean, he's so afraid. <laughs> How much laughter do you think that little girl has gotten out of this moment for days and days and years and years? <laughs> oh, but I mean, you know that there are things in life that legitimately cause fear. Roller coasters might be some of that for some of them. But I want to talk to you today. There, those faces were faces of fear, were they not? All right. And so let me talk to you this morning a little bit. And I'm going to start with, and I'm going to set this up. I'm going to start with 1 Samuel chapter 22. There is a verse of Scripture. Now, let me set it up. King David, he became the anointed king by Samuel. God selected him. But he wasn't a positional king yet. King Saul was still the king. King Saul became jealous because the lady sang the song that Saul has killed his thousand and David killed his ten thousands. So Saul became his enemy. And from that moment, he began to seek to destroy David. David is on the run for his life. While he's on the run for his life, he ends up in the Philistine territory where there's a king named King Achish, Achish, however you want to pronounce it. That king also wanted to kill David. So now he's got his own king chasing him. He's in the territory of the enemy king. And so what David did actually in that moment is he faked to be a madman out of his mind. How many know some of us don't have to fake? <laughs> like... I like what Steve said today about Cambridge Heights High School. He said, high school is just that time before adulthood. You see, I am an adult. Okay. So David is, so David is in Philistine territory. He's acting like a madman so the king won't kill him. The king says, this is the guy we're afraid of? So he lets him, he doesn't do anything. So David then leaves there. He comes to this place here. So David left Gath, and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down there to him. Now, let me get this to you. This is a teenage kid who was anointed king. Okay? King Achish wants to kill him. King Saul wants to kill him. He's on the run for his life. He ends up in a cave called Adullam. And when he gets there, his father's household comes, and they went down there. And 
those who were in distress or dead or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. And about 400 men were with him. So get this. You're a teenage kid, anointed by God. All you've done is serve your king. You killed the giant. You've killed the Philistines. You've served him. He's jealous of you. He wants to destroy you. The enemy wants to destroy you because you're destroying him. Where do you go? You're on the run. You find yourself in a cave, and you get 400 discontented people around you. Sounds like church. No, I'm just kidding. So what does he do? Well, I want to transition you from here to Psalm chapter 34. Because Psalm chapter 34 is a psalm they believe he penned right. He was in this cave of Adullam. So let's see what he did. So he starts like this. I will bless. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. This is what he's saying when he's in that cave, in that cave of affliction. Have you ever been in the cave of affliction? Have you ever had the other afflicted with you? I'm going to tell you something. I've been in that cave once in a while, and I've had some others with me, and there wasn't a whole lot of praise going on. You really got quiet on that one. So anyhow, let's just continue. So let me tell you a few points from those few verses, and I'll get into the meat of the message. First of all, the redeemed of the Lord, they bless the Lord at all times. The redeemed of the Lord bless the Lord at all times. You don't bless him only when things are good. You don't extol him when only things are good. You bless him in the ups. You bless him in the downs. You bless him in the left. You bless him in the right. How many know he's worthy of our praise at all moments of all times? Right? The redeemed of the Lord, glory in the Lord, not circumstances. We don't glory in circumstances. Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content in all things, in all circumstances. Right? Come on, how many know we need to practice that? Anybody with me? Or are you just kind of like, are you the perfect Christian this morning that you got it all down? You never get that. Come on, give me a break. Right? Now watch this. Let me back up once. I like how I have a reverse in this clicker. Some of you are going, he has a reverse. That means it could take longer. He said, I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. The praise of the redeemed in affliction is a testimony to those in affliction. Let the, those who are afflicted hear and praise the Lord. Do you understand this morning that when you are praising God in your affliction, others are hearing that testimony? Do you know what it does for people when they hear that? It will cause them to then praise God in their affliction. Because I'm telling you something, people are seeing you go through it. People are watching you go through it. They hear what comes out of your mouth when you're going through it. And then, let me back up again, reverse. We'll do a beep, beep, beep. Right? He says, and then he says this, and glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So David is in this cave of affliction. He's got 400 people around him who have been afflicted. And what does he say? Hey, guys, let's worship God. When you're in the cave with the afflicted, invite the afflicted to join you in praise to your God. Come on. How many know when we get in the cave with the afflicted, this is what we really like to do. Let me tell you how bad I got it. Oh, yeah, well, let me top that. I got it worse than you. Well, I got it worse than you, and you got it worse than me. I mean, look at her. She's got me for dad. How much worse can it get? Oh, you woke up. Nice to see you woke up. You said amen. Right? Come on. How many know misery loves company? How many know we like to commiserate together? You want, to be, you want to get some sympathy? You want to get some people to commiserate with you? Put your sad little post on Facebook so everybody can tell you how bad you got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, come on. We know we all do it, right? I can't do it. I've been in Facebook jail since May 17th. So if you think I'm picking on your Facebook post, I'm not because I can't get on. Why well, my life's been better. David says, come on, rejoice with me. We might be in a cave of affliction. We might be on the run from Achish. We might be on the run from Saul. But come on, let's magnify our God. Let's lift up our voice this morning. How many know David was the leader of the group? How many know you can set the tone in your cave? How many know, Dad, you can set the tone in your house? How many know, Mom, you can set the tone, right? How many know you can set the tone in a workplace? Hey, Steve Becker, they actually pray at the railroad? 
Imagine that. Now watch what David does. So David starts off with this. And then he goes to this. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. David is in a cave. He's on the run. He's on the run from this king. He's on the run from that king. He's got 400 losers around him. <laughs> okay? And now, here he is. Let me tell you guys, and he gives this testimony. I sought the Lord. Let me tell you something. How many of you have faced or are facing that something that can legitimately cause fear in your life? Okay? How many know fear isn't a wrong thing? There are things that legitimately cause fear. Hey, Patty, were you afraid when Randy was in the hospital 927 days? <laughs> there was a moment of fear, right? It didn't control you, but it was there, right? How many of you have ever had the fear that somebody was in a hospital, they were going to die? How many of you have had a fear of finances? How many of you have ever had a fear of a child who's gone astray, dying? Right? There's all kinds of fears that you can have. He said, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Okay, here's the thing. Things that cause us to fear should be the things that drive us to God. The things that cause us to fear should be the very things that drive us to God. What was David's fear? I got this guy chasing me. I got that guy chasing me. They both want to kill me. They both want, and I haven't done anything to Saul other than serve him. Isn't it an amazing thing when people want to kill you or destroy you because all you've done is be good to them? It is amazing to me the times I have ministered to somebody, tried to sow into their life, only to have them bite me when it was all done. And I'm like, hello? Look, there's a lot of things that you can tell me I'm wrong about, and there's a lot of things you can find fault with me about, but not that one. <laughs> okay? But the things that are fearing, causing fear, should be the very things that drive you to God. When your enemy is seeking you, seek the Lord. I mean, no, he's constantly seeking you. He's seeking whom he may devour. He roars as a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he may destroy, right? And in the midst of that, there are times where there are fear. But what do I do when there's fear? David said, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. The things that cause fear should drive you to the Lord, not away from him. But what happens is when fear enters in, how many know then we want to lean on our own understanding? How many know when fear enters in, we want to walk by sight, not by faith, when it's the time to walk by faith and not by sight? Why do we do that? Well, we seek the Lord because we're confident the Lord will answer, right? Sometimes we may not like the answer. How many of you have ever sought God to get an answer and you got an answer but you didn't like the answer? Only a couple of you? Listen, I told you a couple, I told you a couple times now about that big behemoth monster building sitting over on 11th Street. Not hope. That hope was beautiful and wonderful. And lovely. It's that other big monstrosity over there. You know, that 77,655 square feet of energy sucking space that I didn't want to buy because I didn't want the headache and it to be the albatross and all that stuff that I said it would be. And then when I bought it, I found out I was right. And the Lord says, and, I, and one day the Lord says, very plainly said, buy the stinking building. <sighs> I'm telling you, I wasn't excited. How many know Jonah wasn't excited to go to Nineveh? How many know every answer from God isn't, oh, thank you, Jesus. Some answers are, okay, Jesus. I'm going, but I'm going kicking and screaming. <laughs> right? But how many of you are confident that your Lord will answer you? David called because David was confident that God, when I call, he will answer. We seek the Lord because we need rescued from our fear and our enemy. Hmm. God thinking about that. You know what happens sometimes? Sometimes the fear of our enemy is, uh, the fear our enemy causes is worse than our enemy. Who's the enemy? The enemy of our soul is defeated. The enemy of our soul was defeated already by Jesus at Calvary. You remember the story of David when David first got anointed king? He's got the anointing on him. He goes to the battlefield. There's David. There's the men. There's Israel, the armies of Israel, all the fighting men. And then there's that giant called Goliath. He comes out twice a day, taunts them, asks for somebody to fight him, defies God. Twice a day for 40 days, the armies of Israel ran in fear. 
because of this breathing, towering man who was throwing out these threats. But yet David says, huh, what? Let me at him, and I'll kill him. Let me at him, and I'll kill him. And he did. How many know it was the fear of the enemy that was worse than the enemy himself? The, the men of Israel ran 80 times because of their fear. David, on the other hand, didn't. Did you know this morning that there are times the enemy threat? How many? Okay, how about this? How about this? How many parents in the house? How many of you parents have ever issued an idle threat? Come on. If you do this, I'm going to do this, and you know you weren't going to do that. And guess what? They knew you weren't going to do that either. But you were trying to instill fear. And the problem was you, <laughs> they, they didn't believe you. The problem was you didn't have any bite to that bark. But we try to cause fear by our words and intimidation so they won't do something and it doesn't work. You know the enemy's the same way. Do you know the enemy's always breathing? He's always talking. He's the adversary. How I many you know he's accusing on a 24-7? He's always coming against you. He's always coming to you. He's going to tell you, I'm going to take your kid. I'm going to take your, I'm going to take your husband. I'm going to take your wife. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. How many of you know that he is toothless? But yet, if he can cause fear, that fear is worse than him, he himself. Because how I many you know it begins to govern and dominate our life? And David says this, in this very same psalm that he's writing in this cave of, of affliction. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Those who look to him are radiant. Hmm. Those who look to him. That word look means to give attention to, to give our attention to him. You know what we do when we get into fear? We give our attention to the thing that's causing the fear. In moments of fear, we give our attention to our fear or to our God. We made to make a choice. Right? And I'm not, and listen, and I'm not oblivious to that. We have to, we, we recognize what it is that's causing fear. But then we have to, give, who are we going to give our attention to? Hmm? Did you ever sometimes have a baby in your hand or a toddler and, you know, you're, they're trying to talk to you and you're kind of like, you're, you're half there and half not there, like some of you are on your phone, like when I preach. Okay, I want to draw. And then the, the baby goes... <laughs> I'm talking to you, right? Uh, anybody ever had that happen? I've had that happen, right? We've got to make a choice in these moments of fear, the things that are causing fear in our heart. Where am I going to give my attention to? What am I going to focus upon, right? That which we focus our attention upon will determine our countenance. You can tell people who are half full or half empty people. I, okay, without, like, you know, I'm not really, I, I know we're all Christians in here. But any of you half empty people by nature? You wouldn't put your hand up if you had to. <laughs> it's, the half na it's the half empty nature that's driving that response right now. Because I know darn well everybody in here is not a half full person. How many of you ever get into a situation, it's, you might feel a little sick, you got a little symptom, and you go to Google and you pick out the worst possible uh, 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 ending? Oh my gosh, I'm going to die from this. You know some of you do it. You got a cold. Oh my gosh, I have COVID and I'm going to die. Your countenance gets established by what you're focusing upon. I told somebody, I told you this before, I told somebody to go fast the news for a while. Stop watching Fox. Turn it off. It has set your countenance. You need to fast for a season because it has set your countenance. Fast the news for a while and watch it. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of stuff I don't see on Facebook right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't once, Troy, since May 17th, I haven't once looked on and said, you narcissistic, selfish person. <laughs> but Facebook sure is a narcissistic thing if you want it to be. When we go to the Lord, here's what happens. We draw from his radiance which then makes us radiant. How, how many know that you're going to him and you are drawing from him, right? How many, listen, I've often said this. Sometimes I've looked at ladies who are married and I've asked them, are you loved? Not, are you married? Because how many know you can be married and not loved? 
The Bible says there's four things the world can't bear, and one of those four things are an unloved married woman. How I many you know that sometimes you can look at the countenance of a lady and you can tell if she's loved? Oh, it got quiet in here. Okay, let's talk about the men. I mean, are you, and the same thing goes the other way. Right? How I many know that, that when you are together, somebody else can sometimes set the radiance or the countenance on your face? Well, here's what happens. When we go to the Lord and we're going to draw upon him, what are we drawing from? We're drawing from his radiance. Remember what Paul said? Paul said this. But we all, with unveiled faces, behold us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How many of the Lord sets our countenance? How many of we can go to God and God can make us shine? God can make us radiant? That God can, God can change the countenance of our face? This is what David was saying. David was saying that he would be radiant. He would not be ashamed. How many know when you are born anew from above by God through Christ, how many know you don't walk in shame anymore? You lift up your head, right? Here's the deal. You become what you draw from. I was listening to a young man yesterday. He went to play for Penn State. When he went to play for Penn State, they told him the nutritionist said, you need to gain 30 pounds. Would you like to have that problem? I know some of you do have that problem. And we don't like you. Okay, all right. But yeah, I guess I, I, mean, you, I gained 30 pounds. I'm going to gain 30 pounds. She said this. She said, eat a cheeseburger a day. Okay. And what kind of beer do you drink? He said, I'm 18, ma'am. She said, yeah, right. What kind of beer do you drink? <laughs> right? And he was to do this, and he, gained, he ended up gaining 30 pounds. Why? Because he became what he drew from. How, how many know this morning that you, you will become, you know, uh, what you eat. Hmm? Fact of the matter is, I would love to eat cheeseburger and fries every day. I never went, about, went wrong with a cheeseburger and fries. I never had a bad piece of pizza. Just some is better than others. Come on. Right? But I can't eat that stuff every day. Because if I eat that stuff every day, it ain't going to be good. Right? Then David said, the poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. He was the poor man. Who was he? He was a shepherd kid. He was the eighth son of a guy who didn't even bring him to the party when they were anointing the king. He was just nobody except the anointed of the Lord. But how many know nobody was recognizing that? All right? He was poor. He didn't have any money. He didn't have any name. He didn't have anything that would protect him from his enemies. He could fight, and he had the anointing of God. But outside of that, he had nothing. And when he was in Gath with King Achish, he had nothing. When he's in the cave, he has nothing. But this is what he said. The poor man called, and God saved him out of all of his troubles. Now watch this. Then he says this. Because the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers him. Come on. Did you ever camp around your kids, parents? I text Tony the other day. I watch the kids three days a week. They come to work here, pray for the workers. <laughs> they come in and they just love the place. Are we going to the office today? I haven't, we're getting ready to do the flooring over there. So the other day I have them ripping up flooring. Liam loves to come to the place because he knows where every piece of chocolate is hidden in the office. <laughs> he's just he's like, what are you eating? Nothing. Right? So they had a swimming party the other day to go to. And I text Eric and Tony. I said, hey, the kids want to go to the swimming party at the Kindness Club swimming party. And I said, okay, you know. And yeah, Eric texted me. I said, at Prospect. I said, they were going to Prospect. Happy would be right beside them. <laughs> I know there's some stuff that happens at Prospect, right? Not, I'm not saying anything bad about the place. I'm just saying about some of the stuff that's happened. Pappy would have camped around them had they been going to there. How many of you have ever camped around your children somewhere? Right? David says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Isn't it interesting? There's things in our lives that cause us fear, but if we fear the Lord in a healthy, respectful, honoring way, God camps around us. You see, David was between a rock and a hard place, but the Lord encamps around a rock and a hard place. How many of you ever found yourself in that? You, you didn't know which way to go. You didn't know which way was up. If you went left, it was wrong. If you went right, it was wrong. You didn't know what to do. The angel of the Lord camps around you. The enemy 
may encamp around you, but the Lord encamps around your enemy. Didn't you remember the story of Hezekiah when Sennacherib and all the army of Assyria surrounded the city? Going to take them out, going to destroy them, right? That's when Hezekiah built that tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. I walked that tunnel. Where's Jen? Jen here? George Bell here? Where are they at? They're my buddies. We walked, we walked the tunnel in 2019. We went through that tunnel and we walked. It was the most cold thing. It was incredible to see how they built that tunnel that would bring water from outside the city into the city. But the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord came to their defense one night and killed all the enemy that had surrounded that city. How many of you know you might be surrounded by the enemy, but God surrounds your enemy? There's a story. I won't do it justice, but I'll try my best. There was a, a Cornerstone Television. How many of you remember the time years and years and years ago we had a uh, Walter and Angela. They were rescued by a machine gun preacher from the Sudan when that Joseph Coney was killing everybody. And Cornerstone sent this group of people over to rescue these kids. And it was Tim Bergen that told this story. Remember Dick, Tim Bergen told this? And they were in this village. And all night in the village, they could hear the war drums around them. They could hear the war drums all night. And they knew they were going to get attacked in the morning. They prayed. They waited, prayed, waited. Next morning came. No army. Never got attacked. And somehow they were able to find out why the army retreated. And it was because they said that when they got to the village, they saw the village surrounded by beings in flames of fire. Let me tell you, your God encamps around you. He encamps around the, belief, the redeemed. He encamps around those who fear the Lord. How's that song go, Troy, that one I don't like? Come on, come on, Troy. Oh, no, there's only a few. Just because it's, it's, this is how I fight my battles. I always want to say, this is how I eat my pizza. This is how I do. But it says, you, what's, that, what's that verse? Come on. You may look like, oh, come on. Give me somebody who goes with you. Somebody down here has got it. Yes, thank you. Uh, she's saying, he's saying, thank you, worship leader. All right. You may look like you're surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I'm surrounded by you. Yeah, it may look like you're surrounded, but something like that, right? Remember, the prophet says to a servant, "Look, and how many know he got to see the armies of Israel surrounding the enemy?" David was encamped in a cave of affliction, but the Lord was encamped around the cave. You might have affliction. You might be being afflicted. There might be things causing you fear. There might be things causing you fear in your life and causing you to retreat to a cave. But I promise you, he is encamped around your cave. And then David says this. Remember? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. So I'm going back to that verse. And I'm getting ready to close. Come on, Troy. He's saying, wow, you're done. We're not done yet. Remember David said, those who look to him are radiant. I almost, I'm going to tell you what I almost did this morning, but I felt like, because, you know, sometimes I can be a little ornery. And I almost asked Carson or Tony for some face glitter. You know how women put that glitter on their face and they sparkle and they shine and all that stuff, right? Well, I almost was going to get some this morning and put it on my hands. And I just wanted to walk out here and put it on some people's faces. <laughs> It just because that's literally what the main the, the radiant word comes from. It means to sparkle. It means to shine. And I would literally, literally, had I touched you, I would have changed your countenance. But I didn't do it. You're safe. You see, that's what that word means. Whoa, where where'd it go? Did I hit something? Ah, those who look to him shine. Those who look to him sparkle. Those who look to him are radiant. Remember Moses? He came down off the mountain and his face was radiant. And their faces are never covered with shame. Why is that? How does that work? Let me remind you of a few scriptures in closing. Psalm chapter 31. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. How many know the Lord shines his face upon us? 
He said, let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. I was walking in the office, a little coming in this morning. Eric came walking through. Hey, Jim. Not my Eric, that Eric. He said, where have you been? You're all suntanned. Yeah, he could tell I was in the sun. He could tell things have been shining on me. Might have been the golf course. Could also be sitting in baseball games. Restore us, oh God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Psalm 139. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With boughs in his hand, join in a festive procession upon the horns of the altar. When the Lord, the face of the Lord shines upon you, the face of the redeemed is changed. I tell you this morning, you might be facing some fear. You might be in the cave of affliction. You might be all of that, but I want to tell you something this morning. The Lord's face is able to shine on you even in a cave of affliction. No, I'm not texting anyone. But I could. See, the face of fear gives way to a face of confidence. Have you ever looked at somebody and you could tell they were afraid and you looked at each other and you gained confidence from each other? You know, you can get on that roller coaster and maybe both of you can throw up on each other. No, maybe, right? The face of fear gives way to a, a way to a face of hope. I mean, a fear has a way of stealing hope. Fear has a way of stealing and making people hopeless. But not when God's face shines upon you. Not when you look to the Lord. The face of fear gives way to a face of joy. The face of fear gives way to a face of peace. How many of you can have peace even in the midst of affliction? The face of fear can give way to laughter. You see, in the midst of fear, the face of the redeemed shine like the sun. You might be afflicted. You might be going through hard times. You might be going through difficulty. David was in that place, and he was in that cave of affliction, and he was surrounded by people who were afflicted. But he said, come on, let's praise the Lord. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Come on, come sing with me. Come sing with me. Let's bless the Lord. And then he began to testify that I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And the face of the redeemed is radiant. Man, you got to love your God. Come on, stand with me. I'm on worship team. I'm going to try to sneak up in a prayer. I ain't praying yet. Everybody look at me. I got something to read to you. I haven't done it for a while. We're going to read it, then we're going to sing it. Numbers chapter 6. Everybody look at me. Don't close your eyes. It ain't more spiritual to close your eyes. It ain't more spiritual to hold hands either. I'm so ornery. Come on, let's everybody hold hand. I want you to hold your hand. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you bless the Israelites. Say this to them. The Lord bless you and keep you. Come on. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And the Lord be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Man. Lord, bless you. His face shines upon you. If his face shines upon you, your face shines. He's gracious to you. He gives you peace. It's the redeemed of the Lord that are blessed by the Lord. The redeemed of the Lord have a face. So I got to think about it. I said, Lord, how do I want to close this service today? And I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah, we've done it for a while. We did it for those kids over here. So this is what we're going to do this morning. Worship team, get ready. That side, turn like this and look over there. That's right. And this side, turn this way and look that way. Don't you close those eyes. You keep those eyes open. Because we we're going to sing a song of prayer over each other this morning. And it's called, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. The song's called, The Blessing. Come on, bless each other right now. Come on, Troy. Father, today in this house, there are those.
that God, they're going through times, they're going through uncertain situations, they're going through moments of fear and moments of anxiety and moments of affliction. And Father, the enemy camps around them sometimes, but you camp around the enemy. Your face shine upon them. Your face shines upon them. In the deepest, darkest hour, your face shines. In the deepest, darkest confusion, your face shines. Father, we today, the priest of God, the redeemed of the Lord, we speak to each other. We say, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Father, in our cave of affliction, may we testify so others can hear. May we praise you so the afflicted would hear and give praise to you. In our cave of affliction, may we say with others, come worship with me. Come sing with me. Come bless my God with me. Make us shine, Father. Give us radiant faces in the midst of our afflictions. Close with this. Everybody look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Eyes closed, head bowed, that whole thing. Let me tell you where this starts, though. It starts by becoming the redeemed of the Lord. But how do I become the redeemed of the Lord, you might ask? You simply accept what Jesus did on Calvary. You come to God through Jesus. You come to God saying, I'm guilty. I deserve death. I was a sinner. But I believe that Jesus died for me. But I believe that Jesus went to a cross and paid for my sin. And I want to accept that by faith so I can be saved by grace. I want to be the redeemed of the Lord. But the redeemed of the Lord only become the redeemed of the Lord by accepting the purchase price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Not by going to church and not by doing good things, but by what Jesus did. And this morning, if you're here with every head bowed, every eye closed, and if you've never done that, and today you say, I want to become the redeemed of the Lord, raise your hand nice and high. We got one right here. We got one right there. Pastor John, I'm going to need you. Get... Just keep your hands up, guys, ladies, guys. Pastor Joe, would you come pray with this gentleman right here for me? Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, Father, as they're praying with these men this morning, we say thank you, God, that they said, I want to be the redeemed of the Lord. There's rejoicing in heaven, the Bible says. But Father, this morning, I pray for the rest of us in this house, the rest of us in this house who are the redeemed, and even those who may not be the redeemed of the Lord, that, Father, first of all, that we all would leave here redeemed. You may not have raised your hand. You may not have somebody praying with you, but you can pray it on your own, that you can pray, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I accept what Jesus did on Calvary. I believe that he paid for my sin. I believe that, that you rose him from the dead. I confess with my mouth that he's Lord, and you shall be saved. For others to redeem the Lord, listen to me. You turn your attention to God. And God will turn his attention to you. You turn your attention to God in the midst of your affliction. And he will turn his attention to you. And he will change your face. And he will change your countenance. And he will change your words. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I always forget that last one. And turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I bless you. Have a great week.